1984, in the Tampa Bay area of the Sunshine State of Florida, police were struggling to keep up with the discovery of bodies. It was the biggest serial killer case in Tampa history. Uh, the public was very fearful during the time as the body count rose. We have charged him with nine counts of first degree murder, plus other charges of sexual battery and rape. The killer was Bobby Joe Long. Long is suspected of carrying out over 50 rapes in the Florida area. Bobby Joe Long was a monster. Not only did he rape these women, he also would slash their throats. We had thought Long would be charged with one murder. We were stunned when investigators unloaded nine counts of first degree murder on him. It all happened so fast and was executed with such necessary secrecy. For ex-wife Cindy and their son Christian, this is not the Bobby Joe Long they knew. Bob was a fantastic father. He loved those kids with his entire being. My father, Bobby, always struck me as pretty much storybook father. He taught me how to rabbit hunt. That wonderful guy that I married wasn't the guy that carried out all these horrific murders and rapes. It destroys me to look to look at my family and my children and know that somebody lost their child or their loved one as a result of something that, that my father did. I, I just, it, it kills me to think about that. In 1967, 13-year-old Cindy Brown met 14-year-old Bobby Joe Long in the park. They became childhood sweethearts. We were at the park playing football, a group of kids, and our friend Mike came up and had the new boy in the neighborhood, which was Bob. All of us girls were thinking, oh, he's cute. It's hard to explain, but it was like we were instantly attracted to each other. His personality was fantastic. He was funny. Bobby Joe had moved to Florida with his mother after she left his father. He moved to South Florida with his mother, and uh, he really uh, came to resent his mother over time. She worked as a barmaid in nightclubs, bars, and brought home a lot of different men to the house. And this is something else that really impacted Bobby when he was growing up. He really resented this. His mom, um, she had gone through two marriages while we were kids dating with each other. He hated his mom, the way he talked to her at times. And, you know, she has claimed that he's been physical with her. Despite his troubles at home, Cindy and Bobby's relationship stayed strong. I was adopted by an aunt and an uncle. I do believe that that held a big part of Bob and I together because we, we knew what it was like to not have that other parent around, 14-year-old boyfriend and girlfriend. We used to love going to the movies together. We would go down to the Keys snorkeling, you know, spearfish, um, practice with guns. When he was younger, he and his friends were arrested for stealing car batteries or drag racing, you know, I mean, really stupid stuff. Although Bobby often acted the hard man, he had some unusual medical problems. Bobby Joe Long had what was called the uh, Kleinfelter syndrome, which was a condition where he had an extra female chromosome. And because of that, he developed very large female-like breasts, and this was something that really affected him. He had breast surgery because he would constantly wear a t-shirt. Again, South Florida, you're in the water all the time and everything. He would never swim with his shirt off because he was embarrassed of his scars. The scars weren't bad. When we became older and intimate, he'd keep his shirt on because he wasn't comfortable. In 1972, aged 18, Bobby joins the military. And two years later, 
ask Cindy to marry him. Bob was not a romantic at all. When he proposed to me, he, said, he just said to me, we're always together, we might as well just get married. We went ahead and, and kind of rushed the marriage to go ahead, and we were married January 25th, 1974. We know that the wedding's brought forward because she falls pregnant. Now that gives us an insight into the fact that at that time he wanted to be a family man. At this point, he's at least trying to fit into that moral code. The couple's honeymoon was cut short, three months into married life, when Bobby had a serious accident. He was on his way to work. He was in a really bad motorcycle accident. He got thrown from the motorcycle. He was going about 65 miles an hour and suffered some severe head injuries. I remember they said he flew a good 100 feet, landed on the head. That was the day that our lives changed. I was pregnant with our first child. I ended up having to quit my job to stay home to help take care of him. After the accident, Cindy was convinced Bobby's behavior was different. Even like in the hospital and stuff, he was, I don't know, he just wasn't himself, you know. Before the motorcycle accident, Bob, he treated me like, like a queen. He just always would tell me how beautiful I was. But after the motorcycle accident, he would tell me I was fat or how nobody else would want me, or how stupid I was. He got to the point where he would shove me or he'd grab me by my throat and pin me against the wall and tell me, you know, shut up, you know, don't talk back to me. He started becoming much more violent at times, prone to really violent outbursts. Really kind of developed a, a Jekyll and Hyde personality after that. One of the things that you see in domestic violence and abuse is incremental use and typology of that behavior. So you don't automatically get into a relationship and become violent. It might be name calling, being jealous, then it could be the odd slap, then it could be odd punch, etc., etc. Until in the end, that person is so confused because this loving relationship that they used to know has been so gradual in becoming this incredibly violent, unsafe space that they don't understand quite how they arrived there. And their sense of self and self esteem and confidence has been just completely eradicated. After Bobby Joe Long's motorbike accident in 1974, he was medically discharged from the army. A year later, Bobby and Cindy have their second child and Bobby's behavior began to spiral out of control. It became real physical. I mean, he was punching me in the head. He used to have the habit of sitting on me, on like shoving me down on the bed and he would sit on me on top of the bed, you know, on my bottom part and he would put his knees, you know, up here where I couldn't like, protect myself or protect my face or anything and he would just like pound me in my face or choke me I, how many times he choked me unconscious he enjoys choking and part of that will be for sexual gratification and part of that will be for absolute surrender when somebody is constricting your airway you are absolutely helpless and that person as they are choking you tends to be looking directly into your eyes it is domination beyond belief in our house, um, our bedroom was the first bedroom, and then the kids were at the end of the hallway. They could hear me trying to scream or hear him, you know, shoving me around and everything. They would hear the entire altercation. I remember, you know, knowing that there was something bad going on on the other side of the wall, knowing that my mom was being hit. One time in particular that I remember coming through, coming out of the hallway and walking down the hall, mom's in the bathroom, you know, and you could tell she had been hurt. Um, she was, you know, obviously crying. And, and then I remember seeing my father at the other end of the hallway uh, with this, this look on his face. And it was, it was a look of satisfaction. Seeing my, my dad do the things that he did to my mom was, was uh, heart wrenching. I mean, it, it, would, it was the scariest thing that I had ever seen. Uh, but seeing her get hurt and knowing that I couldn't do anything about it, it would hurt me pretty bad. I had thought about ending the relationship many years, many times. And every time I would say something about divorce, he would again convince me that I was not going to be able to make it on my own with the two kids. In June 1980, 
Cindy was victim to a particularly violent attack at the hands of Bobby. He had, like, knocked me unconscious. He grabbed me by my throat, slammed me into the corner of the old floor model TV. And when I came to, I was laying on the couch, blood all over the place. He says, you need stitches. He goes, but you need to go to the hospital. I'll, I'll stay here with the kids, but if you tell them what happened, I promise you I'll kill you. The doctor came into the hospital room and he says, you know, what happened? And I said, oh, I tripped over a toy and smashed into the corner of the TV. And I, I can't tell these doctors what really happened and because he's going to kill me, you know, and he's got my kids right now. And he came back in, but he had a police officer with him. He says, will you tell the police officer what happened? And I said, you know, I already told you. The police officer looked at me and he said, did that toy have hands? And I said, what are you talking about? And he took a mirror from behind his back and he, and he showed me my neck and I had the perfect fingerprints and bruises already where he had choked me. The policeman told me, I'm gonna come back in a week to check on you. And if you haven't filed for divorce or somehow gotten him to move out of that house, he said, at that point, I'm gonna arrest him because if I don't, he's gonna kill you. I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that Cindy would know that if she did not leave, she was going to leave on a stretcher dead. That's what happens in domestic abuse like this. I came home from the hospital and the humiliation, you know, of being talked to by the police and everything. I just thought the only way out of this is to kill him. I'm tired of being his punching bag and the kids would be better off without him. So I loaded a double barreled shotgun. He's laying there sound asleep and I held it to his head, and every time I would go to pull the trigger, I would think about my kids being in the rooms next to us and what's gonna happen to the kids. The alarm went off at five o'clock in the morning, and he looked at me dead in the eye, and he said, go ahead, bitch, you don't have the nerve. And I said, no, I do have the nerve, but you're not worth losing my children over. In 1980, Bobby Joe Long and Cindy had been married for six years, but during that time, Bobby had been living a double life. Starting back in the late 70s, before Bobby escalated to murder, he committed a lot of rapes. He was known as the classified ad rapist because what he would do is he would look through the classified ads in the newspaper he would call up the number listed on that classified ad, and if a woman answered, he would engage her in conversation. He would set up a time to come by the house. He would show up nicely dressed, often in a suit and tie. Uh, he would ask about the furniture. He would ask if there's anybody there, any, any, any male around that could help load it, uh, if he was interested. If the answer was no, or my husband will be back after five o'clock, then he knew it was a good, uh, good victim for him. We know that Long starts to target women who are selling because firstly, they expect somebody to visit. Secondly, it gives him an instant guise of credibility. He most likely knows that they will be completely alone and that gives him ultimate access to those people. He would then ask to come inside the house and then he would strike. Bobby Joe raped anywhere from 15 to 50 different women using this method and he really bragged afterwards that he, had, he was such a foolproof way of doing it that he would never have been caught if he had just stuck to that. In 1976, just two years into his marriage to Cindy, a very close friend and co-worker of Cindy accused her husband, Bobby Joe Long, of raping her. My friend had gone to the police and said that she had been there and he had raped her. He was completely denying it. Well, apparently the Hialeah police had come to the house looking for Bob and came in the house and, you know, like searched my entire house and everything. And he kept denying it until the police came back to the house and they were questioning him. He finally admitted that they, according to him, they had had sex that day. The thing about rape in particular is that you fully control and dominate an individual. You violate them. You take complete territory over them. It's about ownership. You have to be able to completely disassociate any conviction or any compassion for that human being and render them as just an object to be used. 
After the police investigated it and everything, they cleared him of it. They said that it was consensual and she was probably just mad, which now today, I know it wasn't consensual. I feel in my heart, truly, I, I, that he raped her. Cindy stood by Bobby after he was cleared of the alleged rape. For their son, Christian, he has mostly happy childhood memories of those early years. Growing up, and there was four of us between mom, dad, and my sister and I. Uh, we lived in the typical black and white house, little white fence out front. My father, Bobby, was, uh, for my memory, he, he always struck me as pretty much storybook father. He would always take us kids to the park. We spent time fishing. He taught me how to rabbit hunt. As a family together, we would go out in the boats. Um, we would take the kids to the beach. We would take them to the movies. We'd go on picnics together. We, we would actually take the children um, hunting. My father was pretty well liked by just about anybody that knew him. Christian remembers his father in those early years as quite a good father, you know, somebody who spent time with him fishing, somebody that he connected with. He certainly was not scared of him. In July 1980, after Bobby and Cindy's relationship turned violent, Cindy finally filed for divorce and Bobby moved out. Cindy and Long get divorced when Christian's around six years of age. This is a pretty significant time in a young man's life. His memories of his father will be clear, he's got used to him being around, and it can be quite a distinct change when somebody leaves the family household. So at that point, my dad's like out of the situation. He's gone, you know, he's in California. He's, you know, for, he, I know he was in Mexico for a little bit. He was working on cruise ships. I mean, the guy did all kind. I mean, he was living the life of Riley, apparently. I mean, he was doing things, you know. After we were divorced, he had moved to the Ocala area and um, he was living with a guy and there was a girl. He ended up having sex with her. And I, apparently she said it was not consensual, and he said it was, that he had been charged with this al alleged rape. The rape charges against Bobby Joe Long were dropped again. But a few weeks later, he was allegedly involved in a physical altercation with this victim. After Cindy leaves Long, what we notice is an instant escalation in his violent behavior. He moves in with a friend of his. She accuses him of rape, even though there isn't enough evidence. She then accuses him of battery because she says he pushes her down the stairs. There is a chaos about his behavior. And you can't help but believe that the foundation that Cindy was creating for him has now been ripped away and he's in free fall. In July, 1983, Bobby returns to Florida and moves to Tampa. Tampa in the 80s was known as a party town. Um, it was known for its strip clubs, uh, a lot of prostitutes and partying. It was this area of Tampa, this red light district, which was where Bobby Joe Long found a lot of his victims, came to be known as his hunting grounds. Long then escalates from just raping his victims to actually murdering them his sadistic nature. He enjoys, for example, choking. So if you get turned on sexually, if you have that paraphilia and you choke somebody, then you may want to choke them more and more and more until finally it's too much choking and they die. When you've had that thrill, you want to choke the next person until they die. So these, these roads that we're driving on now, these very rural area roads, these are the types of areas that Bobby Joe Long like to use to dump his victims, to get rid of his victims. Not a lot of people around, uh, a lot of places that you could conceal a body for a long time. Bobby Joe didn't do much to try to hide his victims' bodies. Basically, he would, when he found a spot he liked that was remote enough, out of the way enough, he would just dump the body there. While Bobby Joe Long was out raping and murdering women in Florida, he was also being a father to his son, Christian. He would come down, you know, to Miami, pick us up. We'd see him, you know, and so we had some kind of relationship then. It was like, okay, you know, mom and dad's not together, but, you know, 
at least we get to see him, we get to hang out, we come over, spend a couple weeks with him. But my father's relationship with me was, was pretty normal. I, 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 know, I knew he loved me. It's almost impossible to imagine how somebody can coexist in being a father who was loved and who was liked by his children and a rapist and murderer. To be able to hold in synchronicity those two complete juxtapositions of personality, that also shows us that without doubt there was something fundamentally broken in his psyche to be able to coexist in that way. So we were talking on the phone one morning and I, I watched the news and I had heard like, at this point, I think it was like the fourth or fifth girl from the Tampa area that they had found. And I said to him on the phone, Bob, what the hell's going on in Tampa? And he said to me, he goes, that's what I tell you girls when you go out, you know, on the weekends to the clubs and stuff, you can never be too careful. You just never know. Bobby Joe's personality and kind of the, 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 the psychopathic personality he had to be warning his wife about this when the fact is he's the one out there killing all these people. It was the biggest serial killer case in Tampa history. Bobby Joe Long's killing spree in Tampa, Florida began in March 1984 and lasted nine months. At first, Bobby Joe Long's victims seemed to be only prostitutes, like he was targeting a specific type of victim. By the end of it, he was attacking all women. It was a mystery to police because Tampa Bay hadn't seen a murdering spree like this before. He was a methodical serial killer, very organized. He would make like a hangman's noose so that he could control the victim. Not only did he rape these women, he also would slash their throats. Long is an individual who is ultimately incredibly dangerous, who is a violent murderer and rapist, who is a sexual sadist. I think that Bobby Joe Long, the way that he killed his victims, the way that he raped them, the way that he, take, he took advantage of women in general, it kind of shows his lack of compassion, his lack of a moral compass. And the way that these women were murdered, it's unfathomable. For any normal human, that would be an abhorrent scenario to imagine, even for a rapist, that you become a murderer. But you see, if they're murdered, they can't talk. You know, it's about clearing up your crime. It gets gratification from ending their life, but it also does another job. It makes sure that they're silent and they can't tell anybody about him. There were a lot of similarities in the crime scenes for Bobby Joe's victims. They also found red fibers on a lot of the victims. One of his real hallmarks of his killings was the use of these ligature-like leashes and collars he put on his victims to have total control over the victim. And these were recovered from a lot of the crime scenes. It just depended on the situation that he was in. Some women were killed by getting their throats slashed. Uh, other women were killed by gunshot wounds. In the 1980s, we didn't have the DNA technology we have nowadays. Law enforcement was much more limited in their ability to, to try to track and identify these killers. The investigation into Bobby Joe Long's killings lasted for over 10 months. It was the biggest serial killer case in Tampa history. Uh, the public was very fearful during the time as the body count rose, fear really gripped the community, especially the, the area that Bobby Joe was known to be hunting, and especially for women in the Tampa area. There was a lot of fear. After killing 10 women and raping countless others, Bobby's reign of terror came to an end in November 1986. Bobby Joe's killing would have continued had it not been for one particular victim, Lisa McVeigh, was a 17-year-old girl that he abducted one night on her way home from working the night shift at a Krispy Kreme Donuts in Tampa. He took McVeigh back to his apartment where he held her for 26 hours, repeatedly raping her. Uh, but McVeigh was really smart. She kept her wits about her and she complied with Bobby Joe's demands. She also played on his sympathies and told, told him that she had to uh, care for her ailing grandfather. 
and Bobby Joe began to trust her and uh, seemed to care for her. He told her at one point that he wished he could keep her, but then he ended up letting her go. Lisa McVeigh was really observant of Bobby Joe's apartment. She was able to kind of peek out from underneath the blindfold and see details of the apartment that she was able to give later on to law enforcement, which really helped them to identify where his apartment was. She noticed uh, street signs, she noticed hotel signs, she saw a Quality Inn sign, a Howard Johnson sign. Uh, she also was able to, to see a little bit of where Bobby Joe stopped to make a ATM withdrawal. So she was able to, to give police a lot of details about Bobby Joe's apartment, places they had been, his car. On the 16th of November, 1984, serial killer Bobby Joe Long was arrested by Hillsborough sheriffs for nine counts of first degree murder, sexual battery and rape. Task Force detectives say they have such a strong case against Long that even if they didn't have Long's statements, even if Lisa Rhodes had not escaped to tell her story, fiber evidence and items taken from Long's apartment would have been enough to charge him with all nine murders. Said one detective, he didn't have to tell us a thing, yet police acknowledge there could have been more murders if the pieces had not come so quickly together in those frantic 30 hours before Long's arrest. When Bobby Joe was captured, they finally identified who this serial killer was. It was a huge relief in the community. When he was interviewed by police, Bobby Joe Long revealed how he began targeting women. How did you, uh, how did you pick the victims on it? He was the newspaper. Yeah. Well, he was the newspaper. What did you look for? Also finance. And what would be advertised? Whatever. And you just call up and tell me you want to come by and look at it or what? Yeah. Okay. I didn't hurt any of them. How many there were? Two? Five? Twenty? What's a lot? Bobby's ex-wife Cindy had no idea that the father to her two children was a serial killer and rapist. We had just gotten in from the, the fair with the kids and I get this phone call and it's Bob. I could tell again in his voice something was horribly wrong. And I was like, Bob, what's wrong? And he said, um, you know the girls in Tampa that we were talking about. I killed the girls. And I said, I knew you were capable of hurting somebody because you hurt me, but how could you hurt total strangers? He just kept telling me, please tell the kids I was killed in a car accident. I told him, I said, there's no way that I'm lying to my children. Their voice on the phone came through and said, identified himself as Sergeant Latimer from the Hillsborough Police Department. And he said, we have him in custody and we've arrested him for the killings of at this point, I think it was eight women that they knew about. I panicked. I was like, oh my God, what do I tell the kids? And I kept, I was crying hysterical. I'm like, why? For Cindy finding out that her ex-husband was a serial rapist and killer, to know that the man that she had spent her entire adolescence with, that she had loved, that she had cared for, that she'd had two children with, would have been absolutely life-changing. When I found out my father had been arrested, it was basically a situation. I'm laying in the floor watching TV with my sister, and the phone rang, and mom's talking, and I hear her say, are you kidding me? And it turned around because the tone of voice was just odd, and the look on her face was like absolute terror. She just could not believe what she was hearing on the other end of the phone. We were told that he was arrested, but, you know, we didn't know what for, but within a couple days of that, we, we were told the whole story because we were going to find out anyway. It was all over the news. Mm. 
when Bobby Jo Long was arrested for the Tampa murders, Cindy had to face up to the reality of who her ex-husband had become. I knew in my heart, how could you tell your child, you know, oh, your dad brutally raped these women and then killed them. So I made that decision at that point. I was not going to tell them, the, you know, all the, the gory details about the case. I explained to them, I told you that your daddy hurt people. Well, they act, you know, he, he killed some women. And, um, you know, this is why he's in jail. It made me feel very confused to know that my father had done it. It opened the door to a lot of questions that no kid really should have to ask themselves. Is this something that's going to happen to me because this is my dad? Am I going to do the same things? I was about 10 years old, I think. When he was arrested, you know, my, my entire world changed. What I thought I knew about the world was, was pretty much shattered, destroyed. Once everything hit the news and everybody made the connections, all of a sudden we had friends that weren't allowed to hang out with us anymore. Uh, we had people at school threatening us. I became the target of bullies. We became second-class citizens. On the 22nd of April, 1985, Long went on trial for the murder of Virginia Johnson. The fact that it only took 40 minutes for the jury to consider whether he was guilty or otherwise and unanimously decided that he was demonstrates just how culpable he was. In May 1985, Long was sentenced to death for this one murder. When I heard that my father had received the death penalty, I don't remember being upset, uh, very emotional. I just, I, I kind of expected it. Death Row is a place where people can exist for many, many years, decades, in fact. But when your family is aware that you are on death row and one day that will happen, that your life will be taken, you live in a strange purgatory. They are alive and yet dead. You can never secure your relationship. You can never know when it will be the final goodbye. In 1985, Bobby Joe Long took a plea bargain and pleaded guilty to eight other murders. He then spent nine years in and out of court, fighting his convictions to try and save his life by getting off death row. His trial went through the justice system for years and years and years. He had many retrials. He was convicted of murder. He admitted to many murders and um, had retrial after retrial due to different technicalities, but the death penalty uh, was upheld on appeal. The first time that I had seen him um, on death row and the visit was nice, you know, he was very receptive and it was kind of strange seeing him at that point. And again, Bob, why? Can you just explain to me why? Let me have that closure. Can't explain why. To visit my father in prison was was pretty, it could be pretty taxing um, as far as, you know, emotionally draining goes. You can touch each other, you can hug each other. The eight hours goes by, and that's when the guards pipe up, basically saying it's time to cup up and let's go. You can be angry with somebody and love them, but it's hard to watch them take them back every time. You really kind of relive the loss of your your loved one every time you go up there because you get them back for a few minutes and then all of a sudden they tell you all right you got to get out of here he's got to go back to his box and it's really hard on you the issue with being the son of somebody who has murdered lots of innocent people is of course it's reprehensible it's abhorrent it makes you feel repulsed and yet you only have the relationship that you have experienced with that other human being in your life for Christian, he did love his father, and in spite of what happened, that love doesn't necessarily cease. Bobby Joe Long remained on death row for almost 35 years. In January 2019, Ron DeSantis was appointed the new governor of Florida. Four months later, he signed Long's death warrant, and the execution date was set for Thursday, the 23rd of May, 2019 
at 6 p.m. Whenever we found out about the execution, I'm a wreck, you're, you know, we, we, we had a, there was, you know, obviously a, a, a large range of emotions that we were dealing with. From the time they signed the death warrant to the execution, it all seemed like a blur. It was, it was like a very rushed process. Cindy visited ex-husband Bobby for one last time. I visited with him the week before. The whole way up, I kept praying. Just tell me what to say. I hadn't seen him in 18 years. I was nervous. It was kind of weird knowing that I'm talking to you today, but I know for a fact a week from today, you're no longer going to be on this earth. How that's going to affect my kids. He was their father. Bob never really showed any type of remorse. But when I visited with him prior to the execution, he did tell me, and it was the most sincere apology that I've ever heard from the man, how sorry he was for doing the things that he did to me. I told him, I said, I hate that you're going to be dead, you know, because of our, our kids and everything, but it could have been so different. Yeah, we would have probably been divorced, but you could have still been a part of the kids' lives and the grandkids' lives and taught them how to go to the Keys snorkeling. And, but because of your actions, that's never going to happen. And now they have to know that my grandfather was executed by the state of Florida because of what he's done. I said, you know, Bob, I have to tell you that I forgive you for what you've done to me, but I don't think I'll go to my grave forgiving you for what you've done to all those girls and my children and how you've cheated my grandchildren. I'm sorry. But, you know, he's, and he said, let's change the subject. And I said, no, you're not controlling me anymore. After the death warrant was signed, uh, we found out that we could go up and visit through the week. I think it was six hours a day over a few days. So I did make it up there to see, to see him once, but it wasn't your typical visit. It was behind the glass. It was a non-contact visit, so I didn't even get, a, get to hug him, shake his hand, nothing. I was able to talk to him a few times a week up until the day, and I actually talked to him the day before the execution and asked him if he wanted me to come up there because he was allowed a contact visit the day of the execution and he said that he didn't didn't want us kids to have to come up there and deal with that um, and said that he would just rather truck it on his own. In the days leading up to Long's execution, Christian does speak to his father quite a few times, and he does suggest that he can go and visit him, you know, in those final hours, but Long doesn't want him to. It seems that in spite of the broken, dysfunctional human that Long has become, there is still an empathy and compassion between father and son. And you see, that's the issue when you have a father that you love who is also a murderer. You have to separate the man from the monster. On the 23rd of May, 2019, aged 65, Bobby Joe Long was executed by the state of Florida by lethal injection. Daniel Smithson was a reporter at Long's execution. I was sitting there in that room. The room was somber. You could feel those, those sad feelings in there within the families and victims. The curtain was raised. Uh, Bobby Joe Long's feet were, was, were towards us, and his, he seemed calm. The warden asked him if he had any final words for the victims or the victims' families. You could tell his, his face was kind of rough, and he just said, no, and the state ordered the execution. The execution of Bobby Joe Long was the first execution I had covered. I describe it as just like watching an old man fall asleep. Christian did not attend the execution. I respected his wishes, and he said, if you want to do something, go fishing. Um, hang out with your family. Uh, yeah, so I sat at home, 
hung out with the kids and watched the news. When it comes to him being executed, I it's it's hard to deal with because I feel I feel like I've lost my father three times. First, him and my mother got divorced. So then he comes back around and we start having some kind of relationship. He gets arrested. He goes to prison. And so that's that's number two. You lost him a second of time, you know, so then he, he's he's in a cage. It's hard to get up there to see him. All this time goes by, and then he's executed. So then you got to deal with the permanent loss. Sadly, for Christian, he's always going to be a victim of his father's actions. He lost a father that he loved. And that's the tragedy, that somehow in all of this, for Christian, not only did he lose his past, and what that meant to him, he's lost his future with his father. For Christian's mother, Cindy, her final visit with Bobby before his death brought her closure. My visit with him did give me quite a bit of closure. I finally heard him say that he was sorry for the way that he treated me. You know, I went to therapy for a while because I was having nightmare on top of nightmare. I haven't had the first nightmare since he's been executed, which is just, it's amazing to me because it was always nightmares where he was chasing me or trying to get the kids. So closure as far as that goes. The future for me, I feel like it's pretty bright. Um, I, got, I got seven kids that I adore. Um, my wife, we've been married 17 years and hopefully we, we continue down this path. Um, I, you know, I just, I just want to see things keep getting better, and, and they do a little bit every day. Christian's saving grace is his mother. One of the things that Cindy has always been to him is an absolute foundation of support and love. She is solid. And because he has had that very secure attachment with his mother, he has been able to manifest an ability to cope with the most complex of situations with his father. And that is testament to Cindy. Bobby Joe Long managed to destroy a lot of things in his life, but I have managed to hold on to my beautiful family, and I refuse for anybody to destroy it.